Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Skubani e-commerce mastery series, where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Skubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today, I'm excited. We have Desiree Stoller. She's co-founder of Unshrinkit.com. Desiree, now I see you for real, not just on Shark Tank. <laughs> now, Unshrinkit.com is an emergency sweater saver. They have a patent-pending formulation that helps unshrink wool clothing back to the original size. They were featured on the hit TV show Shark Tank and got an investment offer from Mark Cuban. We'll talk about that. Desiree is an MBA from Harvard and a wool expert is my favorite quotable was quoted saying this could change the world of yarn. Desiree, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. You know, we were talking right before and I was like, what do you really want to talk about? And I love what you said. And you said, let's talk about the tough realities of entrepreneurship. So talk yeah. about some of those tough realities. So I always joke with people that if progress was linear for an entrepreneur, everyone would do it. But it, it never actually is that way. It's always ups and downs, right. <laughs> pitfalls, valleys. Uh, really, I mean, it, it's it's both the ecstasy of, of the moment as well as, as the, the great despair. And right. I always joke with people that if, as long as it's, it's the upward trajectory of the, the pits and valleys, then you're doing okay. Yeah. Um, there is never a week in which all five days, everything that I have planned, every meeting that I'm going to attend, every goal that I have in terms of sales, that every, anything goes according to plan. Yeah. There is always some hiccup in terms of uh, someone has decided internally that they don't want to have this in their product lineup or for whatever reason they have decided that they're going to go in a different direction with laundry. Or someone calls me out the blue and says, I would like to make this order, and it's the largest one of the week. And I had nothing to do with it, but for some reason they saw something that I did three months ago that caught their attention, and a friend of theirs used it, and now they think it should be in their store. Yeah. And so I would tell people that it's good to have goals for each week. It's really good to continuously keep pounding the pavement and trying to get your product out there and making the right connections. Right. But, but on any given week, I have never strung together five perfect days. There'll be two great days and then one day where nothing goes according to plan and then I'll inch my way back up. And, and, and some people can thrive in that environment and for others, that's a lot of um, uncertainty. So Desiree, tell me about one of the great despair moments. Oh, um, I mean, this is, this is uh, peeking into Shark Tank, but I, I'm going to go ahead and go there. Yeah. Because it was by far the biggest the despair uh, moment, Shark Tank. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Hmm. So let's just get straight to it. Yeah. Um, leading into our air date, we were episode eight of season seven. Yeah. Uh, what an adventure! And I'll, I'm sure we'll talk about how we got to that stage. But by the time we were airing, it was supposed to be Friday the thirteenth, which I should have known from the get go. It was a little ominous. <laughs> um, Bad luck. Right? But uh, Friday the thirteenth of November happened to be the day of the Paris attacks. Mm. And so on five o'clock, uh, I received an email from ABC and Sony Studios that they were likely going to preempt us because there was something happening abroad that, uh, depending on how it unfolded, it might not make sense to air Shark Tank. Right, right. Now, for those who are really big fans of Shark Tank and or just like to follow what we talk about, I'm sure you've heard that most companies have prepared a lot of, a lot of inventory in advance for such a showing. Um, which, which are costs involved anytime you have ramped up with um, your inventory. What We also had a customer service team of over 10 people that were helping us because mm. our product is not eating a donut or opening a card. There's there's a process to it. You need to explain also, it a little bit. Yes, there's yeah. a specific fabric and a specific process, and we wanted to make sure people were well informed. And then, quite frankly, we had a lot of back-end web and, and advertising things that were running in place in terms of campaigns that we're all going to take advantage of that showing. Yeah. So between five and MBA Harvard prepared that, oh, that oh, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. <laughs> there's one. Yeah. There's, if there's one thing we're going to do, it's going to try to be prepared. We're not going to wing uh, this thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So between five and eight, I was basically on the phones with everyone saying, "I'm not sure if we're going to air. If we do air, this is what we should do. If we don't mm. air, this is what we should try to do." Yeah. 
I don't know if they're going to start to Eris and then cut away if something happens in Paris. There were a lot of contingency plans that were in place. Yeah. And without any warning whatsoever, we just started airing at 9 p.m. They started the show. Um, everything seemed okay. However, we noticed online that ABC and all of all six of the sharks, even though we were only going to be in front of five, all six of the sharks are well known for posting a lot of comments on Twitter and on Facebook during the hours of airtime to sort of galvanize the fan base and to get people excited about whatever it is they invested in. Mm -hmm. So they all put up the same tweets and picture across their channels, which basically was saying, hashtag pray for Paris. Right, right. So um, contrary to other cycles, uh, weekly cycles, in which there's a lot of repartee between you and your shark or sharks that you rejected or engaged with, there was nothing for us. There's a banter there that goes Yes, down. yes. Yeah. So... I mean, as any good marketer slash salesperson, even though I was in the middle of a huge party that my husband had thrown for me and people were talking to me and excited that our segment was going well, I every five minutes I was refreshing all of our, our different pages, whether that be Amazon or Google Analytics, basically just trying to see really quickly what's going on. Is right. this going to be as big a night as we anticipated? And what... On Trinket saw, and I mean, we're pretty decent friends with the other three teams that aired that night, and I don't want to give away their numbers, but for the most part, the average was that we saw about a fourth of the website hits that we would have expected, mm. and about a fourth of the sales that we would have expected. And for any business that has worked towards going into Shark Tank, it is, it's almost like the Super Bowl for your business, and it's almost, sure. it's, it's yeah. the equivalent of uh, the Super Bowl losing power and <laughs> and not and not happening um, when you're watching that unfold. And so I was up late watching Pacific Standard Time airing. I was up late talking to media who wanted to get my reaction to the, the Mark Cuban deal. And I went to bed around 3 a.m. and I was emotionally and physically spent because although our segment was very positive and uh, we had an amazing edit in terms of, I think we did a good job yeah. on the stage, but the, what they showed in terms of 10 minutes just made us look fantastic. Yeah. Uh, really made our product look like something someone should want to try if they had mm -hmm. an application for it. And right. so everyone was sending me, I mean, I was literally getting texts every minute from people saying, saw you, so happy. And meanwhile, I knew from the back end that it was not the night that we anticipated. Right. And so woke up on Saturday and had tough questions. Is it that... Paris had some undue impact on us? Was it that people just didn't uh, find that our product resonated with them? Right. Is, is there, is, it's hard. There's so many you know, variables there. there it's market hard validation. to identify. Absolutely. Yeah. So my, my background is in media, so I knew where to look to look at the, the ratings from the night. Yeah, where and do you I, look? Yeah. I, oh, Variety. Um, Variety's done a pretty good job at um, overnights and then three-day DVR ratings. And so I could tell immediately that a similar amount of people um, had watched Shark Tank that had watched it the previous night. And so there was this big question mark of, okay, if we had anywhere from 68 million people, why is it that they didn't go to our website and, or purchase in the same amount that we would have anticipated? And I reached out to a couple of my producing friends and they said, look, we, we could tell on our end that this was going to be a crazy night for the four of you. And the last time this happened was 2011 with Osama bin Laden on a Friday night. And we just don't have a lot to go by, but we would tell you, um, don't don't freak out. Give it a couple days. Um, You're and, like, but I have three garages just, full of <laughs> trinket. Like, oh, and I'm that's joking. easier for you my, to say, my, don't freak my out. Core, um, no. um, my co-founder uh, in in Boston literally had a garage filled. I mean, we had our manufacturer that had a lot that had been sent out in huge pallets to Amazon. But we also had some for manual fulfillment in case that all ran out. And yeah. yes, we had garage full of, of inventory. Right. And so I asked the team, I said, look, it's too early to tell now what the full impact is. So let's give it a full week to see what happens. Right. So <laughs> um, by Monday morning, I had over 800 emails to respond to. Good luck. Uh, yeah. We, by Monday morning, we, in fact, starting as early as Saturday, we saw that the website hit started to tick upwards, hmm. um, that the sales were ticking upwards through the weekend, if not the full next 10 days, we more than blew through what we thought we were going to sell that opening weekend. And so, um, also what came from that was that people 
responded very strongly to uh, Lori in particular, not uh, like truly getting on board. I was really surprised at that. Yeah. Yeah, we were yeah. too. But yeah. you know, sometimes things, <laughs> things sometimes things don't work out the way you anticipate. And people were emailing and saying, "Here's the the contact information information of my nearest craft store," or I, "I'm mm. in the military and I think the military commissaries should have this," or mm. "I run five dry cleaners. We'd like to take an order." And so by the time awesome. I had made my my way through the emails, we had a bunch of wholesale mm. orders. We had some licensing offers. We had a couple acquisition offers. I had a lot of people just saying, "Love this. So glad you you created it." Obviously, it's Shark Tanks. There are a couple people that said, I don't like your product at all, but those were in the <laughs> far minority. And then more importantly, we, we made up on the metrics that we, we were despairing about. And so um, I'm, I'm praying that no other Shark Tank team ever has to deal with what we, we went through because it, ultimately that was caused by a, a horrible tragedy. Right. But it was a huge lesson for me that um, sometimes the dips will be all out, like, huge holes in the ground and you you won't know if you're going to get out of it and you need to give yourself a couple days one to breathe and, and get some sleep and two to let the market respond in a way that works for them and, and basically what happened was people watch the show but instead of doing the normal behavior where they immediately go to on trinket.com or go to our, our twitter page they were checking it appears they were online checking out the latest news of paris which sure. makes sense yeah so it wasn't until 24 48 hours later that they said what was that company that was on drinking wool i thought they were cool that's when they looked us up yeah that's so a crazy anyway, story um i mean i i could write a book about the hour by hour <laughs> play of that but i won't bore you on it but no anyway, it's not boring at all sure. actually so was, would you would you recommend someone who's going to be aired not even have a party just like should you have been locked in an office with a computer and a phone and just been um, Coordinate because so, it sounds like you had a lot of coordination that you need to do yeah, so minute we, by minute. So what we did, the biggest coordination, if you've done your job well, all happens before the airing, mm -hmm. and you have you're only a ten minute segment and a full hour, so there's room to actually be doing a lot of work in the you know the segment before you actually enjoy watching yourself for ten minutes and then immediately go back to work, and that's basically what happened during that hour. Once it was over, I took about 25 minutes to answer Q&A from the crowd of people who had come to uh, to the party, and then I went back downstairs yeah. and didn't work. Yeah. So tell me about this. This is interesting. In preparation, right? So yes. talk about those components of pre you know, preparation, oh, yeah. the back end. Um, you talked about investing in, in a certain amount of bottles. How, how do you decide how many... And how do you project how many to invest in? How many did you actually, if you can't share the range, the range that you yeah, actually no, end no. up getting? So, no, that's fine. And and I will say this because this was representative of us reaching out to people. And I, I would say that I, I joke with a lot of people, we should create a Shark Tank alumni group because there are mm -hmm. not that many of us. They only air about, a hundred, uh, at least since season three, they've aired about 100 each season. And I mean, out of the 50,000 people that apply. So it's it's. It's like a, a mini university of sorts. Yeah. And so I basically looked for people who had done something in the laundry space that was a consumer good, uh, that who had made a deal on the air and reached out because I wanted I wanted to get it as close as possible to being something akin to us. And I also looked for things that were in our price point. So something that was between ten and twenty, because yeah. the last thing you want to do is ask someone who has a sixty dollar yeah. specialty laundry basket. Um, but they did, but uh we then reached out to those companies and said, "What were the sum of the companies, and what did they say?" Well, I don't want. I don't want to. Oh, because I'm, <laughs> I, I immediately go to Scrub Daddy is maybe one that would be seen that so would Scrub, be. So Scrub Daddy because they have. I mean, they're the king of all of Shark Tank. Sure. In terms of, the, I think the most successful, right? Generated. Yes, by yeah. far. So most people don't even ask them because one, all their metrics are publicly listed everywhere, and I feel like they updated every month or two anyway yeah and second they've they've just had a bonanza um after their airing in, in season five what we did because a lot of these people are entrepreneurs and they're very busy yeah. i reached out to a lot of them and most of them um most of them did i will be honest didn't get back yeah. but what i did was i knew that particularly for seasons five and season six a lot of people were very amenable to answering reporters questions on well what did you do this weekend or mm. how successful was the first month and so I basically stalked all of the the reports in which they, they came out in the first week after Shark Tank 
and look to see what sort of business that they would talk about that they did. And sometimes they didn't talk about sales. Sometimes they talked about website hits or they would talk about the mm -hmm. growth in their social social network. But I knew what I, our internal conversion rate was for people going from our website to actually purchasing a bottle. So I could sort of extrapolate from there. Yeah. If they were seeing X number of website hits, what should we start to see? So I had a range um, that was pretty wide, actually. It was from 3,000 all the way up to 10,000 for our category and then what I did was units of product uh, unit, unit, yeah. units, units of, of, of product that went yeah. out the door that first weekend and so what I did was um, we sort of prepared for something slightly north of the the mean and then tried to um, have a back we had a couple of backup plans and if for some reason that went over and so that's why we had product in the garage that's why we had a manufacturing team that was ready to press go you know on Monday if we needed right. more etc yeah. So talk about some of the back end because you had people in yes. place. So what was the important component that you knew you needed? You said you had a sales team. And how do you even train the sales team? Oh, mm. yeah. So I, we had a customer service team. Customer service team. Okay. Customer service, yeah, That's yeah. what I mean. Yeah. 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 So what we just, we have people who reach out to us across every possible channel we own. So I have people who will write me on Facebook, on Twitter, on our website, on our contact us page. Um, who will call us all asking similar questions. Can I use it? How does it work? Mm. Tried using it and have questions. Um, can I get this in Canada? <laughs> Got a lot of, can I get this in Canada? Mm. <laughs> Canada? It, it runs the gamut. And the cute thing is that people will email you about and give you the backstory of their scarf and why they want to save it and then say, can I save it? It's it's X percentage merino, X percentage alpaca, and X percentage uh, cashmere. And, you know, they want a, an answer on that, and that's that's wonderful. Yeah. So what we did was, one, we uh, we delegated who owned particular channels. So I'm particularly comfortable, you know, very quickly writing and engaging with someone on the social media channels where people are a bit more demanding in terms of the speed in which you need to get back to them. Right. I had uh, one of my co-founders who was manning the contact us page as well as the phone. Um and since our that night in particular, we actually had most of the phone calls going directly to voicemail, so we could capture the that phone number, get the full message, actually take our time in getting back to people. And he was meeting that with a team of about six or seven people. And yeah. what he did was help train them on what are the key key things to recognize in the message, and when she should know what information they're looking for. What is the tone that we're trying to respond to people? Um, if for whatever reason they're they're looking. For, they respond to you multiple times because sometimes someone will create a, a conversation with you. How do you engage with that? But also make sure that at some point you're concluding what they need and moving on to the next person. So it was, we in many ways just mapped out what are going to be the top 25, 30 questions we expect and what are some of the key yeah. uh, aspects of that you should answer. And then for the things that you you could never anticipate, who do you call to give you more information? Yeah. But I, that c customer service for us was particularly important because when we did our first iteration of our product, we didn't focus on it too much. And we we realized if you have something that is brand new to the market and you're yeah. creating a brand new category, a brand new brand new product, you have to be overly proactive in reaching yeah. out and helping people. So what have you learned from customer feedback? Mm. One, that you have to stay even keeled because you're usually going to get the happiest of people and the most upset of yeah, people. Right. And it's going to seem as though it's a roller coaster in which people yeah. love to hit your product. But in the grand scheme of things, what we discovered is about 90, 95% of people never reach out to us at all. You're seeing the extremes in terms right. of, of people people and their, their usage of the product. And then, in, and then to always exercise a great deal of patience. We have worked with this product day in and day out now for two years. We know it backwards and forwards. If someone has just heard about our product and they watched in a 10 minute snippet on, on Shark Tank and they were eating dinner while they watched it and the kid was you know running around and, and doing something, all they really captured was something to untrain clothes. Right. So they might not have caught the part where you said it's for wool or cashmere wool blends. They might right. not have caught the part where they need to actually mix it with warm water and you know to, to treat people as you would treat your grandmother. In terms of, it takes her a little bit longer to pick up on it, and or she doesn't have as much context. 
but you should be just as caring and just as patient yeah. with her as you are with me. Yeah. So, I mean, like, what uh, was productive feedback, like, that actually maybe helped you improve the product? Was there anything oh, oh, else? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, from the get-go, uh, so our first iteration of the product, one, we had no manufacturer guarantee, which we quickly heard from people. They said, this is something that's brand new to me. Why should I take a chance on you on something that's not I'm not getting in my store, that I haven't heard from my neighbors? All I've seen is your website. And so mm. we had, we realized that if we felt confident enough in our product to be selling it and to be working on it full time, then the least we could do is say to someone, if you don't have a, a, a positive or the perfect experience, we're going to give you a refund. Like that was something that we decided was yeah. important. There were little things such as when we were doing all of our internal testing and testing with our analytical lab, we were working with liters. And when we put mix on trinket with three liters of water, a lot of people said, I never deal with liters in my home. I either deal with quarts or gallons. Hmm. So I don't even know what the heck to use when you tell me this. Can, is there any way that she, we were getting lots of questions like, what does this mean in terms of things I have in my home? And so we updated our instructions so that it was very clear in a way that people understood. Um, we also talked about with people, I'm trying to think what's, what's another good one in terms of customer service. What's the biggest objection you get and then how do you overcome it? Mm. Why don't you work on cotton? <laughs> why don't you work on cotton? And why can't I use this on cotton? And um, can I try it on cotton? Can I take a risk using it on cotton? And uh, it's funny that they're so happy that you've you've even entered the space and you've done something specific to yeah. that they immediately wanted to then apply to other aspects of their life that would be helpful. Yeah. Now, one we, um, I actually had a guy who said, I'm really excited about unshrinking my dollar pack of white t-shirts from Walmart and I, <laughs> I, I, it took me it took me a lot to not to not laugh because right. um, part of the reason why we did wool and probably why our next product will be for denim is it's more expensive why pay 10 12 dollars right. to save something that is is the same <laughs> same amount as your your item you should go out and just buy a new one and right. so I, I say to people about cotton they say we know that you wear a lot of cotton and we yeah. know that you care to save it um, to a certain extent, you and I both know that you're probably just going to go buy a new old Navy t-shirt. You're not going to want to try to save right. it. End of story. There are those old t-shirts that you probably have tried to throw away that your husband has, right? Those old <laughs> cotton t-shirts. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's really because they shrunk. It's normally because he's had them for way Exactly. Long. Exactly. Yes. That's true. Um, so talk about the conversion rate. I mean, you were very methodical. What did you do to increase the conversion rate? And, and uh, yeah, talk about that. Uh, one, we try to eliminate the pathway to getting to the purchase. Okay. So one of the things we did prior to Shark Tank, we actually had a very different website. It had a lot of content on the homepage, we had a lot of content on the product page, and it was more of an yeah. immersive experience in which someone was going to learn information about on Trinket. Yeah. And the guidance we got from people who had worked with other Shark Tank teams as well as previous Shark Tank teams was, one, you want to have the most... Uh, efficient experience possible. Yeah. Somebody comes to your website, you reinforce that they you, they just saw you on Shark Tank, that this is the product for this particular use case, and they immediately are going to purchase. They have a huge buy later button on, on the page later, or yeah. something. Yeah. Later on, they can figure out more information about your wool guide and later, you know, right. more information about your story about the two founders. Yeah. At that For that weekend, it should all be about sales. And so we cut down our content by almost 80%. So the website is was very streamlined. Then yeah. we also um, we had several other uh, platforms that we were redirecting people to in order to just talking yeah. about. And we basically sent all traffic to Amazon. Yeah, and I saw that. Yeah, and yeah. the thought was, um, you, I mean, we were prepared for a crazy number of visitors, but a great backup is to have your sales your sales platform be something that's so large and so robust yeah. that not gonna even break. if we went down, people yeah. can still access Amazon and I purchase see. Us. So yeah. was there a debate internally about, okay, do we send them to our own shopping cart? Do we send it to Amazon? Or was it a no-brainer? Uh, it, well, it was a no-brainer only because we had done that previously. So fall of 2014, we were selling on our website. Yeah. And what we discovered was people were spending more time trying to figure out should they trust us should they should they purchase it? Are were the reviews mm. valid? 
But when we found that when we switch everything over to Amazon, they yeah. trust that one through five star system. They trust those reviews, particularly yeah. if they're verified by the purchaser. And there was a much faster, we went from around a 10, 11% conversion to being something akin to almost one out of four were converting once they hit. That's amazing. Page. So it was worthwhile to keep it there and yeah. just and just get people through the door. Yeah. So what are you think are advantages and disadvantages of sending to Amazon? Mm. For someone who's debating, the advantages are, are are super super easy. Uh, they own your customer data, right. and it's the biggest trade off you make. You, one people uh, who are within the Amazon platform love Prime. They love the ratings. They love the consistency of the interface. How quickly it is to make the purchase with the one click. But the one sacrifice you make is that you don't own. Yeah, their Amazon that's a great customers. point. Yeah, so if you want to send a huge blast out to everyone and say, it's been two weeks since uh, Shark Tank and we want to hear about your experience. You can't do that to yeah. those customers. Um, and so what we did to complement that, and they've done an excellent job, we work with this team called Feedback 5. Sure, yeah. And you can leverage them to basically reach out to people post-purchase and to check in on the experience. And that's helped us better own the um, the post purchase experience, yeah. Um, but to a certain extent, that's the one big trade off you make with Amazon, and I know that's why a lot of my entrepreneurial friends don't do it because they want to create this huge database of people that are using it. But I find that their products are much more dependent on someone purchasing it, uh, purchasing their product on a monthly basis. It's not mm -hmm. a subscription service by chance, but they they need more frequent purchases. Yeah. And our business model is one in which we need someone to purchase on Trinket every winter season. Yeah. So there's less pressure on, I'm not going to circle back with someone because it's Patrick's Day and say, oh, you know, St. Patty's Day. Have you untrunk your, you know, your ugly Patrick's Day sweater? That's that's not really, a, you know, an, an issue per se. I guess you have to team up with that other one on Shark Tank, the ugly sweater yeah, the, company the tipsy, or something. The tipsy elves. Yes, exactly. Elves. Yeah. That was actually the most surprising thing. Um, they didn't show it completely, but Robert loved our product. And he was the most effusive. And then when it came time to dole out an offer, Damon was in there, Kevin was in there, Mark obviously jumped into the last minute, but at no point did he just sort of make a move. And we were we were very surprised because there was a natural compliment there to him already having You ship a bottle of, <laughs> of unshrink it with every sweater. Yeah, 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 no, I just, here's your insurance policy. Stay ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so what else didn't we see? That, or that didn't air. What else didn't we see? So there was, I mean, there was quite a, a, a debate. About, how long was, how long were you oh, up we there? we were talking? there for two hours. Two hours. Um, yeah. Which I will tell you felt like 20 minutes. Yeah. And we walked off the stage and our associate producers said, great job. And we were like, wow, that just flew by. And they said, no, it didn't. You were there for a long time. And we said, how long? And it's two hours. Wow. Oh my gosh. Uh, which then, of course, made me scared because I'm thinking, oh, God, they're going to cut down two hours to 10 minutes. What are they going to decide to – you could create a completely different day out of two hours. Right. Um, but uh, what, let me think about what didn't happen. One, there was a pretty fierce debate about that market size. So they focused on Lori because uh, we actually had a huge Facebook group of thousands of people who were going to watch it that night. And – uh, the the poll question I had was who who do you think we made a deal with and it was close to seventy five percent thought we went with Lori, right. which is why they showed it on the show. But it's like it seems like a a good fit for like a infomercial or something like that. Abs absolutely. Yeah. Now one of our concerns was that she is a powerhouse at what we would call um, at HBS we would call it a sustaining innovation. So it's our, the product is already in the market and someone has come out with a slightly better one or a slightly cooler one. She's very, very good with products where you, she doesn't have to explain it to you that this is a sponge. What's cool is that this sponge can flip and you know can do the, ho the hard stuff and the soft stuff. Or here's a purse that can also carry your, fo your phone. Like it's, it's intuitive. You can look at it and get it. Yes, she very rarely will go with something where she has to mm -hmm. Educate the market. So let me back up for a second, Desiree, because yeah. people don't truly understand the research that both you and Nate did for this, okay? Because I, I was doing my own research, and you were spending how much, how many hours per week for how long preparing for this? It was a full-time job. Yeah. Um, so at the time, it was the spring of 2015. Yeah. Because uh, this is not random. You guys put a Excel spread. I mean, talk a little bit about what. Yeah. 
what the so preparation I, you did. We decided yeah. that we were going to download the seasons three through six because those included Mark Cuban, and we knew he would be there for season seven. Right. Uh, we watched the shows, and I, with the database, I, I probably went a bit overboard, but I felt like every detail could eventually be helpful. So mm-hmm. I had the company, the people that came out to represent it, their gender, their roundabout age, what they were wearing, what they asked for. Uh, how they pitched, like wh- what did they have on the set, what questions they received, uh, what pushback they received, mm-hmm. who ultimately al- offered a deal, what was some of the negotiation that went on there, and then if did they get it, did they walk away with a deal or did they say no, etc. And so we did that for every single segment to try to pick up trends for what things might. Um, unduly set a, a shark off. Like the last right. thing you want is to say something that has right. obviously been shown in a different different right. season where they hate that phrase, right. where they hate this. So what were some approach. of those things that they hated? I mean, so people who come in who don't really understand their customer acquisition costs mm. or people who come in and for whatever reason, um, the lack of sales is because they have outsourced everything to someone else and haven't actually tried to go and talk to people. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, with Lori, her zero hero thing, we knew that we had, as best possible, needed to try to defend our market size. We thought that was something that she might be worried about. And Mm. so we had three or four different counter arguments for her for how to defend what we thought would be our market size. We knew all of Robert, we knew the hobbies and the interests of all the sharks. We knew uh, where they were from. We, you know, we were planning, we made sure, we wanted to make sure that Kevin knew that we were from Boston. We knew that uh, Mark would care that uh, Nate was right near where he used to grow up in Pennsylvania. You know, we, Everything that we could possibly capture about right. them, we knew, we knew everyone. You were maximizing. Ages of, we knew the ages of the children, who actually might have things in their home that were shrunk, who did their own laundry. You're Mark like, did Mark laundry. Cuban, I talked to your wife the other day. She says, yes! you do need this product. And she shrunk yes! your favorite Mav sweater or something. Yeah. Um, I mean, and ultimately it, it came down to there have been other entrepreneurs who, for whatever reason, had to go to the fire and messed up or lost out on a deal because they didn't know this information yeah. and the least we can do is learn from what they had to experience and not make that same mistake mm-hmm. um so we were between the preparation for the pitch uh working with the producers uh finishing up our, our what we wanted to showcase for our product and actually just doing the research it was it ranged anywhere from 20 to 40 hours a week yeah that's what i read and yeah i i i mean it A lot of people spend their last semester at HBS going to dinners, bonding with people, traveling, doing an independent project. We were basically, I was basically non-existent to people. Um, And I I had, people joked, but I had four hours a week that I devoted to social activities. And I would literally leave a party after like an hour and 20 minutes and say, this is my cap. I need to go. Because I had a husband who lived in D.C. I had cases to read. And I... There was just so much, so many hours yeah. in the day. So, what numbers, Desiree, did you and Nate prepare ready for Shark Tank? Uh, in terms of what we wanted, what you wanted, and also oh, yeah. I mean, we, so to we, answer questions. Sure. So we, good grief, the whole thing. We had we knew our business numbers inside and out in terms of, you know, if they asked about last six months, last year, the totality of our company, what were our projections in terms mm-hmm. of sales, and who were we. Uh, what were we expecting to do over the next um, by month, by year, next five years? We also knew um, our costs. We knew our um, our revenues versus our profits. Like one of the things that we were always worried about is that it's not that people don't know their business. It's that most people are in front of these these sharks for an hour to two hours, and after a while, you might get flustered, you might get nervous, yeah. and what they're looking for is to see: Do you know your business so well that yeah. even under intense pressure you don't contradict yourself or make a mistake and so the last thing you want to do is mix up revenues with profits or mix up uh, your cogs if you were to scale at X level versus a different level we just wanted to make sure that we didn't make dumb mistakes and then in terms of the negotiation you might have noticed this I I, uh, purposely 
let, wanted Nate to lead that because he does numbers exceptionally fast in his head. Mm -hmm. I can do numbers fast if I'm sitting in my room by myself, but under pressure, yeah. that is not my that is not my forte. Yeah. And so I wanted someone. We knew that we wanted to stay somewhere in between ten and eighteen percent of giving away our company, which is a very very uh, narrow it's window. A small window, yeah. Tank. Yeah. Um, and we needed to be able to play around with that, and needed someone who was going to be comfortable. Uh, just sort of going tip for tie with them. And so that's yeah. why Nate led that part. So, gi so give people an idea, Desiree, going into Shark Tank, how <laughs> long was the company um, in existence? And then how many sales did you have at the time going in? So going into Shark Tank, we had been around for basically a year. So we started and we incorporated in June of 2014, yeah. in June of 2015, but we had not sold a bottle we didn't start selling it until september of 2014 so we mm. were basically coming to the conclusion of our sweater season which is september through may and before we we're going on shark tank and one of the concerns that uh our friends had now here's the funny thing until the moment you apply to shark tank you tell everyone oh i'm planning to apply to shark right. tank i'm really excited as soon as they express an interest in you you have to pretend that nothing is happening yeah and so, there's, there's <laughs> so prior to being told they were interested, I was asking people, I said, should we go on? We've only sold about four or 5,000 units. And everyone said, oh, no, it's too early. It's too early. They're going to eat you alive. Shark Tank has gotten too big for the small businesses. That's, you know, you would have been great in seasons two or three, but now they're looking for the million dollar offers and the mm -hmm. people who are making 300,000 and you know, annual revenue already. And I, and I said, well, who's saying they, that? I mean, so basically all of the Shark Tank fans are people who they uh, think know Shark Tank. I gotcha. So it's not I, like an associate producer at Shark Tank that's saying it's, it's like, <laughs> no, 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 okay. no, no, not not at all. These these are uh, both intense and casual fans. Who, right, right. Their perception: Shark Tank gets bigger and bigger each year. So right. to make people's jaws drop, they need to have uh, bigger bets, bigger asks, etc. Yeah. And I said, look, I hear you, but at its core, Shark Tank was made to be the American dream during the recession. Right. You know, small businesses couldn't get loans. So this was the place you went for anything from fifty to fifty thousand to two hundred thousand so that you could keep your business going or make it grow. So they need they still need businesses like myself that are going in with, you know, a a new business, you know, not a lot of sales, but a lot of promise and, yeah. you know, a decent amount of revenue that shows that uh we're we're not just sucking in money that we're actually making money off of it too. Mm -hmm. Um and so it was a risk. It was always a risk that they said, "This is too early. You haven't you haven't uh, proved yourself. Sell more bottles, etc." And we that's why that's probably why we went the extra mile in preparing because we we felt if we could truly nail the questions and our plans that they could they could have confidence that we as a team were people worth investing in. What question were you most nervous to get into and debate and answer? Mm. Probably the market size because yeah. we we had at that point we were part of the bot, um, multiple accelerators. We were at the Harvard Innovation Lab. We were part of Mass Challenge. We had pitched at the New Venture Competition out of Boston. Yeah. We had uh, pitched at Thai Thai Boston, which was basically a, a local Shark Tank event for um, for people. And each and every time, people. The judges basically bifurcated. It was they completely got the market size, right. never questioned it, and wanted to hear how we were going to execute against that. Yeah. Or they didn't get it at all, and they couldn't see past anything else. It was, but tell me how you know how is this going to be something that you know yeah. could have a, a great return? Yeah. And so the last thing we wanted was all of our time in front of the sharks to be about market size when there were so many more interesting things yeah. about the future of the company and or what we had currently done that would really sort of sell them. Um, and so we had prepared the heck out of that um, in terms of not just talking about what we had done um, to date, but what was coming down the next six months, as well as what we were planning to do once we had the funding. Um, and that was and the nice thing, which I don't I don't know if they showcased it as much as they did, but Four out of the five, never really question it. In mm -hmm. fact, there was a really, really beautiful moment, at least for me, where the four sharks who were all men, because Barbara wasn't part of our group, were sort of turning to Lori and saying, we just don't understand why you don't get this. <laughs> because the QVC woman is 
uh, normally a married woman with kids who I'm sure is making mistakes and or doesn't take all of her laundry to the dry cleaners. She's doing a lot at home. Yeah. And, you know, we get this. And yeah. um, one of our biggest fears was that you need people who are engaging with laundry and have like a real a real life and make real life mistakes. Right. And all of these people... You're are wondering, like, how much are some of these people doing laundry? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're multimillionaires, and they have people right. who do their laundry. And right. the great thing, thank God, is that like, Damon, Kevin, Mark, uh, Mark, and Robert all started from very humble beginnings. Um, in fact, Lori did too, to a certain extent. But, I mean, I want to say for a longer period of time, she's had it, um, she's been doing quite well. But all of them come from relatively humble beginnings. They remember those days of making mistakes, and that's what helped us. Yeah. I think if we had started out with people who had always been well off, that, that might have been a harder sell. Yeah. So after Shark Tank, Desiree, so those are the numbers before. If, what can you share after? What were sales like after? Um, let's say that, so it's December 2015, and we've already doubled all of what we did of last year, huh. and we're only halfway through the season. Congrats. So, That's awesome. Yeah. So what's the next step in execution? Like you were saying, people want to know and you wanted to answer how yeah. you're going to execute. Yes. So what's, what's working best now after, because people will think, well, that's right. You know, that's easy. You know, you had shark tank, but, oh, yeah, but yeah, once yeah. the shark yeah. tank buzz dies down, yep. you start to have to execute a different game plan. Obviously that's actually your wheelhouse is the media side of things. So that was yes. perfect. Yes. Um, so you maximize that. Now, what is working best on a day to day without like a huge explosion from Shark Tank? Exactly. So the biggest thing for us has actually been a ground game with the wholesale accounts. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we reach out. It's, to me, it's it's all about going local. So general merchants, knitting shops, universities, dry cleaners. That has been our our game from the the get go because you want to be in places in which people are contextually thinking about your product or laundry right. and or that's where, uh, for the example of universities, um, our biggest surprise our first year was that 40% of our customers were uh, young men between about 18 and 25. Really? Doing laundry for the first time. <laughs> and so, <laughs> they I mean, shrink everything. <laughs> I mean, not to knock the young men, but uh, they, they seem to It's be okay. Involved. We're not that <laughs> smart when it comes to a lot of things, especially I mean, laundry. I, I just noticed that yeah. Every every guy I know just throws all the laundry in together and For they just sure. it all comes I still out do okay. That. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't work that way. You have to sort. Um, so anyway, uh, what we've been focusing on is completely separate from Shark Tank. And guess what? The whole world doesn't work Shark Tank. You can say that to people and they say, "Oh, that's cool," but most often than not, they haven't heard about Shark Tank. If anything, right. it's it's an extra cachet later when you say, "Oh yes, and this was also featured on the on the sh on the show." But for us, it's been a, a very strong and consistent outreach effort yeah. to saying this is a... How did you identify that? Like how? you Yeah, how did you identify that, that, that you, like young males in universities mm -hmm. would be one of the biggest customers? Because so I, I opposite, I would think, oh, like moms is Oh, that was perfect, our first beginning. Right. right. We spent so, a lot of our... We didn't, we didn't have a lot of money to spend, but what money we did spend, we spent it on mummy blogs and reaching out to moms and saying, yeah. influential moms and saying, will you write about us? Yeah. And while that was was very effective, when we first started, we were on our own platform on Shopify. And I kept seeing these mail names come in. And, you know, by all means, I don't want to <laughs> stereotype when I'm seeing a name, but when yeah. Barry comes in or when Luke comes in, it's obviously a guy. Luke, yeah. And yeah. so... <laughs> And so I, I was putting in the addresses and I could tell that some the address was in hmm. university regional code. And then what we actually did was after we had sold about 5,000, you got to take advantage of your resources that are yeah, I love hearing a methodical I, mind. So yeah, keep going with this. Yeah. <laughs> so I um, downloaded all of our geo codes and sent them off to um, a lab at Harvard um, it was a bunch of grad students who were actually correlating and w were willing to run for you a map of where you were selling your mm, product. That's cool. Yeah. And one, I wanted to disprove from people that were concerned that we didn't sell in Florida and Texas and California because we do sell a lot of bottles there. They're very sensitive to sweater weather under 65 degrees. Um, but second, I wanted to see where if we were having hot spots around yeah. locations. And that's yeah. what was So what did you find? What were the hot spots? Well, one, it was... Um, 
I thought it was going to be our assumption going in yeah. was that it was going to be metropolitan areas, that it was going to be quarter metropolitan areas, and that it was going to be mainly moms. What came out was that from a gender distribution, it was 60 40 female male. That in terms of location, we were getting suburbia as well as um, what I'd call residential city areas outside of a city, as well as the city itself. Not a lot on the, the rural side. Um, and I want to say that's, that's probably because uh, they might do a better job of taking time to wash their clothes. I, we're still working out the, the um, assumptions there. Uh, but then more importantly, that we were in the pockets that were rural, it was because it was near a university. Hmm. So um, a good example of that. Uh, so let me, let me think of a good one. So Blacksburg in Virginia which most people don't even know what the heck that is, uh, unless you're a football fan. That is where Virginia Tech is. Right. And um, uh, the concentration was Blacksburg. So it was it was mm. the college town. Right around the university. To, yeah. So how do you get in the hands of those people? What Now you know where they live. So yes. what do you do to get it in the hands of them? So it's one of the things that we're actually building out right now mm. is a mini sales force of students at those universities. Mm. Because... We do have contacts at the the bookstores, but the faster way to do it is to get it into people who will be in many ways an ambassador for you on the campus and mm. actually show show other talk about it to other people, use it, have it in their room. Um, that's one of the ways that we we feel that it's it's going to work faster. I'm a huge. This is probably because I'm an entrepreneur, because I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm a huge fan of avoiding bureaucracy. And when you go top down and you have to go to the university and then the bookstore and get on the shelf and then there's placement fees and whole nine yards. That can be a whole year before you're in front yeah. of the student. So you really do a grassroots effort yes. to get yes. it in there. So yes. where do you start with that? Because, I mean, this is helpful for any business, right, oh, to yeah. have a grassroots effort uh, for something like this. Are there companies out there that will serve, like, help you get in front of college students or do you just have to go out and no, you know, I would, do I mean, guerrilla marketing they're, style? They're, they're, there are companies... I joke with people, when it comes to sales and marketing, there is a plethora of companies. There, you will never have a shortage of companies that will focus on just one thing and help you do it. But ultimately, if you want control over what they're saying, how it's being done, yeah. um, and or you want it to happen faster and cheaper, yeah. you should try to do it yourself. So what I did, um, because I, when we, we've always just been very careful with every dollar that we have, is that I started out with universities that we know. So we, I knew Harvard and I knew University of Virginia because that was my undergrad. With Harvard, there were several different laundry places right there near us in Cambridge. So I, we walked over to the dry cleaners and came with our, our, our bottles and our packaging and said, well, you have this here in your dry cleaners. We can do it on consignment. Start mm -hmm. here. So no um, risk for them, essentially. Yeah, no, no risk whatsoever. And, and meanwhile, it, it creates a relationship. They learn a little bit more about the product. The next time people are coming in and they're already in the mindset of taking care of their nicer yeah. clothing, it's something that's there. We also reached out to student groups that were focused on helping businesses in the area and asked for them to, to so for example, um, and maybe this is just HBS, but there are a lot of ugly sweater parties. And I didn't hesitate to reach out to any person I knew that was in a particular location um, representing Harvard or UVA and say, do you mind receiving six bottles of Untrinket for your ugly sweater party? They're already in the context of wearing sweaters. You can give it out for free. We can be the prize for the ugly sweater party. Hmm. Use the bottles as you see fit. But what I find is that if I send six bottles to an ugly sweater party, we have people coming back saying, we gave your information out to people. We have people following up saying we'd like to buy a bottle, and those six bottles are are very quickly are, are um, going out the door, and so it, it creates it amplifies our message in yeah. the in the areas that we want. Yeah. Um. In term, for example, University of Virginia, um, I reached out to friends and said, "I'm not there right now. I haven't been on campus in almost a decade in terms of an actual student. Yeah. Can you let me know what are the most respected dry cleaners in the area that either do a concierge service for students and or or, you know, or just to go to places and they put yeah. me in contact with them and that's how I could quickly get the information and say, can I send you a bottle? Yeah. So what else is working with increasing sales, the grassroots effort? Oh, so completely opposite from grassroots effort is uh, going abroad. So one hmm. of the things that happened after Shark Tank was that on a daily basis, we were getting dozens of emails from people in Canada saying, can we please get this? Can hmm. we please get this before the holidays? Hmm. Now, 
Uh, Canada has the lovely province of Quebec, ha which has a lot of different regulatory uh, needs because it's a majority French-speaking uh, province. But what we did was we opened up international shipping for mm. Canada just to test out how well is it going to ship? Are, pe are people just saying that they want it or are they actually going to purchase it? Is there a um, lot of red tape to get that set up for you? Yeah, or? I mean, yeah. A, a lot and a little. It's it's um, a little if you're w willing to spend a lot of money to make it go fast. And it's a lot if you're any small business and you want to just be very careful with how you're spending your money and or you don't want to have to completely change your packaging for Quebec. I see, um, right, because you have to put yeah, French. Yeah, and it's not just yeah. that you need to call out um, French for your product identity. You need to actually have the French like, French uh, version be larger, and um, there's certain things that you have to change to your warnings and whatnot. Hmm. So we opened up international shipping so that people from Canada could purchase it. And what amazed me was that um, it actually, one, it showcased to us that there really was demand. So we're actually going through the process from a high-level regulatory standpoint, I'm actually getting it into the country as well as yeah. for the EU, Australia, and New Zealand. Yeah. But it also gave us a little bit more insight into the price elasticity for our products. So Lori actually called this out. She, yeah. So she thought it was priced too high. Um, and I know her sweet spot is things. Were you sweet. saying it was 11 to $14? Or so we, we told her on the show we retail um, 12 to 14 12 to 15, 12 to 14 And we yeah. normally sell it for $12. Right. Um, and she thought that was too high. And hmm. the funny thing for us is, one, $12 has never been, at least from what we can tell, has never put a damp in our, our sales or the demand. Yeah. But for Canada and um, Europe, there have been people who have purchased it who have paid 10 to $15 for shipping. So, so <laughs> it's we like to, 25 like actually, $30. Dollars. Yeah. So, so once we With the exchange it, rate and everything, yeah. too. So when we actually get it into the country... There's a lot of room for us to even charge a higher price. Yeah. I've always wanted this to be something that's accessible, um, a, a mass product that people are, are, are picking up at the same time they do their detergent and their their dryer sheets, etc. I don't want it to be some premium niche product, but if anything, that was uh, another data point for us that we are at the right price, price point because if someone's willing to pay twice as much just to get it, yeah. <laughs> Um, they live elsewhere. Than we're doing. Yeah. So wholesale is working grassroots, international. So what have you found that you thought would work that has not worked mm. that you had to stop doing? So one of my, it's, it's, it's been a, a enigma to me is that the most avid group, people that there is no price point by which they would want this product um, or they would pay a hundred dollars to have it are knitters crafting groups. They will not pay for it. Uh, no, no, no. That they would pay eighty dollars. Oh, for they pay a lot. Okay. Um, is the knitting craft craft group. Mm. And that just to, to break it down for you, imagine that they have bought a skein of, of, of wool. It's taken them like three years. Yeah, it's to it's do taken something. them yeah. three three, four months to make yeah. a sweater for someone and some yeah. intricate pattern that they learned. Yeah. Um, they spent a good if it was premium wool, maybe forty, yeah. fifty dollars just on the wool. Then it's their yeah, time yeah. involved. Then it was for someone, yeah. and it was a gift yeah. of some nature. Yeah. And then the, the recipient yeah. shrinks it. So remind and, me of this, Desiree, because I've interviewed and you know some of the some of the top uh, yeah, yeah. e-commerce um, yarn knitting e-commerce sites <laughs> that I've talked yes. to. So yes. yeah, so I'll have to tell you about those. So go on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. When we first launched, we were covered on, on Revelry. We were covered on Knitting Paradise. We were covered on Knitter's Review. Yeah. We, I mean, blogging sites about it, the whole nine yards. And so I always thought it was going to be the easiest sell ever to put it in front of knitting and craft shop owners and say, purchase this. Mm. Don't you want it? <laughs> and what has fascinated me is that it has just not resonated with the owners oh, as really? much as it has with the actual um Makers or consumers or, or the consumers or it resonates with, but the owners, the owners don't see it. No, and they're more. And what's interesting is that they hmm. they care a lot about the the wool, the dyeing, the 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 tools to actually making something, yeah. but they're not as yeah. interested on the back end. If once someone yeah. has already finished making it, they've washed it. How do they save it? I per see. Se. They geek and out on the knitting part. 
but they could care less about afterwards. And the people, that's, that's a real problem for some of these people. Absolutely. And I mean, every once in a while, I'll have a knitting shop that, that says someone came in and they wanted it because they, they shrunk something and they would they would like it. But um, I, hmm. I have found them to be a, a relatively resistant group. It's always wow. been on the, on the consumer side, never from yeah. the knitting shop side. Wow. So what else have you found that you tried that has not worked that you, you're surprised about? What would Nate I mean, say? This is, what this would, is like trial and error, but I'm, I'm thinking yeah. of a, a good one. Yeah. Um, I'm very, very thoughtful on how we do on online ads. Yeah. If at all. Yeah. Talk so about I online ads. Lot, yeah. I know a lot of businesses invest a great deal of money in um, social media ads and and online ads. Retargeting ads, I think, have some value because if someone has gone as so far as to visit your website. And for whatever reason, they didn't put a product in the cart. Yeah. I think it's valuable to follow them along their online uh, experience and, and to remind them that they they were at some point were interested in the product. Yeah. But I have found that organic engagement with people, particularly on Twitter and Facebook, has been so much more valuable than hmm. seeing up Facebook ads yeah. um, or, or Twitter ads. Uh, I have searches for like content all marketing very, have, type of stuff. Like yeah, I mean, I have I have saved searches for all things related to shrinkage and sweaters and wool on Twitter on Twitter. And if I see someone with a message and within a reasonable amount of time, I'm getting reaching out to them and saying right. that I can save it. That is so much more effective mm -hmm. than trying to winnow down on all of the different all mm -hmm. the different levers that you have with a with a social media ad to try to reach. The target group, which yeah. in many ways is for us, is is very uh, context driven. It's right. that they they're doing laundry and they know yeah. they make this mistake and or they just made it. Yeah, you know what's funny and that reminds me of you know the the Shark Tank because both you and Nate obviously I don't know you that well but you both seem very very conservative, you know as far as uh, professional conservative then he comes out with saying about shrinkage, you know and <laughs> <laughs> and. Oh, and God. So I will tell you that the pitch, the pitch is a baby <laughs> that you produce with the producers. It is not, it's rare, it's very rare that it's something that is, is uh, representative of what you as the founders wanted to do. I, we probably did 50 iterations of that opening pitch right. and the goal, and you see this with any Shark Tank episode, um, their goal is to sort of hook someone in, in the first minute of your pitch. Right. And then you'll watch the remaining 15 minutes. Right. And frankly, if they can hook you in from the opening pitch, they normally have you for the rest of the hour. Right. Uh, so their goal... You were testing what the opening lines were going to be. So what were some we, of the things wanted, that lost? We, yeah. Oh, God. I'd have to look them up. I mean, a lot of them had to do with um, making fun of the story when I was at Harvard Business School. And when I tried to fix my sweater, I ended up having a crop top. We had a couple of jokes that were directed at particular sharks um, and at the end of the day they wanted something that was going to make like a one-liner uh, yeah well eyebrows raised and, and almost like a huh like what's going on here and and it got that reaction i mean even my uh our friends and our spouses who had seen us um at some point practice indoor you know i after it was over it let them know you know at least i mean Nate and I definitely told our spouses because you, you have to travel to LA. You, you need to let your spouse know if you're leaving the, <laughs> the state for some place. Right. And they even forgot about that line, and they loved it when they saw yeah. it, and they laughed. And um, that one was was one that we planted, and we thought if if that one lands well, yeah, we might have a chance. The other one was, and I'm I still blush, even though you can't tell because I'm black, but I still <laughs> blush every time I think about it. Um, the I look good, don't I? I cannot believe I did that in front of the sharks, but I did. And so that was planned or was not planned? Oh, it was planned. Oh, it was planned, okay. It was planned, but um, this the level of sass that I did there was, was I, I, I yeah. think I tried to make it really, uh, make it a moment. Yeah. Now, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a good direct mail piece to college males. Do you experience shrinkage, question mark, in the dorm rooms? And then they're all going to read that. <laughs> I, I, who wouldn't? I, I, in fact, I don't know any male who wouldn't, who wouldn't read that, <laughs> college or otherwise. So talk about the Mark Cuban investment a little bit and what advice he's given you in, in working with him. Sure. 
So this is, uh, I will give you short and long, long answers because yeah. you deserve both. The short answer is that we didn't close our deal with Mark. Mm. So the advice we received from him was uh, non-existent because we never actually were in a room with him. Mm. We spent all of our time with his business team. Um, and I mean, to the, the deal not closing, I think most people know this, that you shake on, on the set, but then there's a lot of- uh, Due diligence. Well, more contractual things like term sheets and mm. negotiations on, you know, what is going to be the nature of our partnership with one another and right. how long will that play out, et cetera. And that that can, one, take time if you have a difference of opinion on how that should look. And two, um, as you get closer and closer to a potential air date, you as a, a founder and an entrepreneur need to decide to what extent do I want to move forward with someone who at this point has 60 other 60 90 other companies that they're they're working with or do yeah. or do I take a risk and simply um, leverage the additional awareness and the the additional sales and potentially find alternative investors who might be able to engage with me on a, mm-hmm. a closer basis and and more likely are really passionate not just about consumer goods but about laundry or something particular mm-hmm. to what you're doing you knew, need someone who's going to say this is going to change the world of yarn that's who you need yeah, yeah, an yes. or or <laughs> I, you know or revolutionize laundry and, and, and is really passionate about that um hmm. but one of the reasons why we selected him is because we call him the entrepreneur's entrepreneur he never at least in my opinion has never really lost that touch of I want to see hustle. I want to see right. full commitments. I want to see yeah. um, people who are working as hard as possible to make their business grow. And so just being around his business team, we were constantly pushing ourselves to to um, exceed goals, to to close deals. That's the underlying that, that's, value that they yeah, that, have to. That, that's the essence that he puts forth to people. And yeah. he, the last thing you want to do is to – to be working with Mark Cuban and he think that he's you're not trying hard enough. That's right. it's horrible. Yeah. Um but what I did learn from his business team, one, I am two hundred percent smarter on how to think of term sheets and how to negotiate on behalf of my business, having engaged with them. And I mean these are nice guys from Texas. They um I was I'm not joking, I decided to fly down to Dallas um, to visit them, and they said I was the first person that Mark Cuban has ever signed a deal with, or shook his hand to the deal with who actually decided to visit them. Wow. First time ever. That's so wild. They took me out to lunch, and you know, I got to learn a lot about how they partner with businesses and how they support them. Mm. And so it's not – one of the things I love is that we were very well informed of what a partnership with him would have been like, mm. and um, I think still made a really good decision for our, our, our business. Um, so ultimately, the terms didn't mix with both parties. Yeah, no, they yeah. didn't. But that's, I mean, and at the end of the day, we are incredibly grateful because I think more so than any other shark, Mark Cuban is the one that if he makes a deal with you, people who don't even care about consumer goods and certainly don't care about laundry, they will look you up because they'll want to say, what did Mark Cuban invest in? That's mm, interesting. interesting. Um, the other four, and this is not a knock against them, but they, like, um, like Lori and Damon, even Kevin, to a certain extent, people think, well, they like consumer goods, and they like things that moms might like, and so they just think it's, it, for whatever reason, it might be a personal reason or an affinity reason that led them to it, but Mark, they know that um, quite often, if it's not his bread and butter, which is uh, tech or something that is... Um, uh, that appeals to him from a sports perspective. If it's something completely out of his wheelhouse, they will they will take the time to understand and look into you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, if anything, I think that's why we got a lot of attention from uh, what I would say surprise license and and um, acquisition yeah. and interested parties because yeah. they, they said, "What is this company that that Mark Cuban you know gave yeah. us to?" I mean, you're gonna have future partners or in whatever respect but so what did you learn from their the team mm-hmm. uh, the support I mean, team I mean, with I mean, from partner yes. from a partnering perspective that so you could I, take and other people the basic stuff yeah. so leading into the airing they had really detailed thoughts about how can you best optimize your website to hmm. translate to sales and what are some of the things that you can do in the back end to actually accelerate mm-hmm the right people getting through the funnel to to making a purchase. 
they had specifics on. So what's some who, who was this stuff our, you already talked about with the back end or something um, different? Yes and no. So they actually had suggestions for rejiggering the menu, what things should actually be on the opening page. Like, and I appreciated that 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 was the level of detail in which they wanted to help someone yeah. uh, have an ideal website for that night. But then on the back end, I don't know that a lot of business teams will dive into who's your hosting provider and how are you mm -hmm. redirecting DDoS attacks and what are you thinking about in terms of uh, maximizing um once you maximize your traffic, how are you making sure that you're you're filtering those people into the right places and making sure that for those that you think might be repeat purchasers, yeah. it's getting them to sign up for your, your newsletter. It was just a, a level of attention that I thought was really well yeah. done. Yeah. So I have a few more questions, and I just realized I'm like the Shark Tank pitch that took two hours. It seemed like 20 minutes. I know. So I'm looking up. I'm like, oh, my goodness. It's a full – It's we're, we're at the hour, so – um, I can wrap it up or I can ask a few more questions. It's, I don't know what you, yeah, let's you know. compromise. We'll ask two more questions. Okay. <laughs> we'll go with that. I could go with a hundred more, but I'll go oh, with two. Oh, man. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I, we haven't even talked about before all this, before even selling Desiree, you guys have to create a stellar product. Yes. And so I want you to talk a little bit about the creation and actually testing of something that's proprietary. Oh my goodness. Because that's not uh, an easy task in itself. Now we're talking about now you're selling it, but you had to actually create it and test it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I will I will give full shout out to Nate here. Yeah. When I went to him, crop top and all, saying this is something we have to fix, I I knew that more than likely we were going to need a chemical product to do it. But yeah. he was, I mean, at no point was there any hesitation to reach out to Bloomberg and say, "Hi, we need to we need to research." The science behind wool shrinkage. Do you know where we should look? <laughs> They're like, who are you? I know. And yeah. and and he said, I think there's some books at the Cornell Fiber Science Department. Since we're all Ivy League, is there any way that we can get those on loan? And they they arranged for us to have these huge 1950s textbooks sent to us. We ordered about a dozen active ingredients and tested them first in our dorm. Um, what Nate did, given his product development background, was that he had a very rigorous process for how are we going to what are the benchmarks for success how are we going to repeat that yeah. and the first two months was basically us just being mad scientists in our dorm room mm -hmm. and we felt I have this written down about you on my sheet of notes as a mad testing scientist so yeah oh uh, yeah <laughs> um, after two months we felt pretty confident that we had something that was working um, and not not just working, but in the home ingredients, but just was was working yeah. really well well enough that we thought it could be a product. And so yeah. Nate pretty quickly uh, reached out to um, uh, Lando and Anastasi, which is an IP law firm in Boston, and said, you know, we'd like to start looking into the patent protection for this. And that was something that I would recommend to any entrepreneur mm -hmm. if you think you have created something, found something that is proprietary. Um, and potentially can be easily replicable. Don't hesitate to try to plant a flag. By all means, you know it's it's no guarantee that it's going to go through. But but the worst thing you can do is is say that for a couple thousand dollars, I didn't try to protect something that that was my idea. Yeah. Um. In terms of the testing, though, this was almost a year process. Yeah. So that people don't realize this, and that's why at the top of the interview when you talk about the tough realities, it's not like you just threw together yeah. this. This is a process. Yeah. I mean, one, it was it was just getting over the disbelief from a lot of people that we could do something in this nature because wool, chem wool um, manufacturers, PhD chemists were saying, wait a minute, your science makes sense, your process makes sense. How did you guys figure this out? And we said, well, we just read and we tried to figure out what was the reaction that was happening and we tried to figure out active ingredients that would reverse the reaction and we played around in our dorm rooms and this is what occurred. Yeah. Um, but after getting it validated by, by other chemists, we spent almost a year trying to figure out, okay, our base ingredient works on loosely knit sweaters and sweaters that haven't had that much shrinkage. But guess what? Americans make really bad mistakes sometimes in the laundry room. So yeah. we need something that's going to work for the really shrunk sweaters. Toughest as cases. Possible. Yeah. yeah. And, and also for ones that are very tightly wound. Um, we are... I mean, to a certain extent, we've cracked this nut, but there's still some work to be done. We also yeah. wanted to improve the scent 
and for the lion's share. That is actually well, the biggest oh feedback God. I it's read very, online. It's, just, it's it has been such a battle with this. So yeah, we we've done enough testing where we know that it's it's over like ninety five percent of people have no issue with the smell. But we're discovering that we never we never said in our instructions and to the point of constant learning as a business. When we normally worked with all of our testing and when it was done testing in, in the chemical labs and it was done testing with consumer yeah. um, testing, um, almost all of the circumstances were done with newer sweaters. So someone has purchased it, washed it, um, uh, shrunk it, and then they're trying to fix it. What we're discovering is that there is a very small subset of people who have shrunk something and then they wear it and then they put it in the back of the pile but they haven't washed it again. And we're discovering that the mixture of what it appears to be um, deodorant slash whatever sort of if someone took it to the dry cleaners, some of the treatments that they use, hmm. it's negative. The chemicals are mixing. It's interacting with our product and creating an odor. And that's wow. because that's not something that we, uh, at least right now, can control. We're yeah. going back into the lab and saying, is there something that we need to potentially have in like a little baggie that we say to people included in the mixtures so that it actually yeah. um, neutralizes some external factors that mm. are, at least at, to this point, haven't been right. in control. But I cannot tell you how how crazy it has been for us to try to, because um, we know, and at first we were going crazy, like how is it possible that someone can be having a negative odor scent? And then we, we so what we did is we, we started asking people, We, we it, I'm sure it was annoying, but we said, when did you buy this? Did you wash it? Did you, you know, did you wear it before you tried to yeah. shrink it? And um, we're starting to see a little bit of a pattern there yeah. that's giving us some information. You're trying to pay Sherlock what, Holmes with people it. people don't yeah. realize is that we're not trying to be static here. Every every iteration we're saying, okay, what have we learned from this huge batch that's sold that's making this better? Because at the end of the day, prior to April of 2014, this did not exist at all. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, when Surprisingly, you, when you pick up a Tide or a Woolite today, it is the product of years and years of finessing. Yeah. It is not the same Woolite or Tide that came out at the at the, at the beginning of the stage. So right, right. We're, we're working, <laughs> we're working on it. So, since you're holding me to one last question, I'm just going to state a couple that I was yeah. going to ask, but I'm not going to. All but right. So I thought an interesting one, the Gromit. I thought was interesting where you kind of got your start. I think people should look that up because you sold an initial run that sold out very quickly and that was interesting early on to get some traction um the future of unshrink it because i know you probably have products in the pipeline or ideas so i was going to ask about that um but what i will ask is and i i have to put a a plug in for the sponsor about um you know imagine if you can combine all software tools you currently run your e-commerce business in a one centralized cloud platform at a fraction of the cost would people do it? Of course they would. It's Skubana. They do all that. And I personally actually use them. And what I love about them is for you, um, actually it automates the entire 3PL communication. So inventory management, so you don't oversell if you're on Amazon or eBay or in your warehouse. I love that about them. And they also have a skew profitability. So I know which product is actually profitable, and which one isn't. Right. Um, which is huge. So my question is around software because you were talking about the Mark Cuban team being so intricate in looking at the hosting and yes. and the optimization. So tell people a little bit about the tools you use, the software is from an e-commerce uh, entrepreneur standpoint. I have to give a shout out to my web developer. So I, I worked with a guy um, uh, uh, out of Los Angeles named um, Nick. He's IM Managers. And... I called him the Friday after we found out about Shark Tank and said, hey, I love the website that you built for us. Just wanted to give you a heads up that we're going to be on Shark Tank and we're expecting um, tens of thousands of people visiting it, um, not over a week, but in like five minute period right. uh, at the outset. And um, I haven't, I've done some updates to the website, but it's, it's probably not Shark Tank ready. And he basically, he and his team basically dropped everything and mm. spent almost... 10 hours a day between the day I told them to the day we, we launched mm. looking at every single aspect of our website. So to your, to your question, um, one, we looked at rejiggering the website that so it was highly streamlined. We then added Cloudflare and um, changed my hosting to, um, to cloud, a combination of Cloudflare and Liquid Web because we wanted to make sure that we could actually withstand mm-hmm. a lot of the, um, 
the intense traffic that was coming. Mm -hmm. Uh, we had, we were working with, um, Adroll for retargeting. Mm -hmm. We were, oh my goodness, there's like a whole lot of stuff going on right now. We had, um, Zopum running our, our customer service on mm -hmm. our site so that people could engage with us real time, um, as they were, um, asked if they had any questions. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, so our, our website is based off of WordPress. We basically went through and stress test every single plugin that we had. Mm. We eliminated things that we didn't need. We compressed every single piece of content that I had on there. Um, from an inventory perspective, a lot of that was managed and assisted by Amazon. Fun story, the night of uh, Shark Tank, we had a pallet worth of product that was outside of the uh, fulfillment center in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. And when you're a large company like that and there's a whole process for getting uh, uh, inventory in, uh, no one wanted to rush. Uh, and by rush, I mean walk outside to the truck and tag that our product was in the system so that it would show up as being available to people on Prime. No one wanted to, to rush that process. And my husband on a whim said, well, you know, I read somewhere that Jeff Bezos reads all of his email. So maybe you should just email him. And I said, you mean like Jeff at Amazon.com, like email Jeff, Jeff Bezos and, and ask him? And, and they said, yes. And I said, okay, um, okay. So I emailed Jeff at Amazon.com and said, hey, here is my uh, product ID. Here is my name. Here is what we're expecting. Here is the fulfillment center in which it's going. It would mean the world to us if we could have an additional 2,000 uh, <laughs> of, our, of our bottles in the inventory uh, before Shark Tank airs tonight. I never heard back from him, but in two hours, I got a call from the Amazon Executive Seller Support Services hmm. saying that, an, quote, an executive had brought to their attention that we were having issues wow. with the product um, and that they had looked into the situation over the past 45 minutes and were able to accelerate our product getting into the fulfillment center so yeah. it would be marked as prime. Uh, so I, I that wasn't a, a e-commerce software platform. That was just damn good customer service from a CEO of a really large company. Um, and to me, what was funny was, uh, I think I mentioned at the very beginning of the, of the interview that we had hundreds of emails afterwards. And like 800 there, were, or there were important emails and then there were like, this could lead to a huge sale or a yeah. huge partnership. And then there were a lot of one-off customer emails just saying, I saw you on Shark Tank, loved you, can't wait to use you. Yeah. And when Jeff made that happen that Friday night, I swore to myself, I said, I will not sleep more than five hours a night until I make it through all of these emails because yeah. if he can do it at his level with his with the the – how much he's his managing. company yeah. then damn it i can re i can respond to these people too and and yeah. engage with them like a person yeah um that's the best story of all time does that's <laughs> the best story of all time <laughs> it, i to this day i mean i wrote him back um on uh thanksgiving day and say one of the people i'm most grateful for this past year is you because you showed me what true customer service is like and yeah. uh you, you surprised me on a night where <laughs> there were already going to be a lot of surprises so yeah uh yeah crazy that's a perfect uh, i know place. people think that amazon is just des destroying the world some days but i will tell <laughs> you that um they've earned every piece of goodwill they've had yeah. because if their ceo can still do that today then that says a lot about yeah that's a perfect place i can't even ask another question that's a perfect place to end it desiree i appreciate you coming on everyone should check out unshrinkit.com where should people reach out to you or check out online where should they go Oh, for me or yeah, for you, directly? the company. Where should oh, where do you want to point them through? Directly, they can email Desiree at onshrinkit.com. Yeah, check it out on Amazon. Check it out on their website. Yes. Desiree, fantastic! Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jeremy. All right.